Thank you very much for tuning in. So today we're going to talk about proactive cluster auto-scaling in Kubernetes, um, which is a fancy word for saying when our apps become we scale so much, what do we do? How do we actually make sure that they scale quick enough? So let's start with um, who I am. So my name is uh, Daniela, or you can call me Dan. Any, no, any name really works. Um, some friends joke on my name, they call D5V, yeah, which is a joke on Kubernetes. And um, I mainly I mainly do I mainly look I mainly teach Kubernetes and um, and do a little pipe and, and write Python applications on the side. And these days I mainly write Starlight to be honest, the quite quite a lot of it. Um, so a dialect of, of Python. So um, what and um, and also a certified community administrator. So I, I and I spend quite a lot of time. Um, Sort of looking at applications and deploying them, and sort of took one was one of the first to, to first five hundred to to obtain the certification for for Kubernetes. But what I want to talk about um, today is um, is more about the problem that that you have when when you deploy when you deploy an application. So most of the time, what we do is we we deploy these applications in in virtual machines, and these virtual machines have got a fixed um, size so they've got some memory and some cpu and everything is fine when you run a single instance of this application however the challenge sometimes is how do we make sure that this application can grow and we can have multiple instances and we can handle the traffic that the production infrastructure will you know the live traffic of of, of the service that we are about to deploy now a single service sometimes is not enough um, to accomplish that goal. So generally what we do is we find ways to have multiple servers and we find ways to, to combine them together. And I guess that's actually where the challenge comes from. And the first challenge when you start to, when you start to hit this problem, the, the challenge is, okay, with a single server, everything was fine because I could deploy everything in, into a single virtual machine, for example. Um, but as soon as you start adding more service, then you need a way to orchestrate. We need a way to distribute these applications. So you need a way to find how do we actually how do we actually make sure that each each server has got a little bit of them. And and if you do that with few nodes, what happens when you scale those nodes to hundreds or thousands of nodes? How do I actually keep track of where those applications are deployed? The other challenge that you might face is that. Okay, when everything is deployed on a single server, it's quite easy to use localhost and, and just make requests within, within the single server. So if you have like several Flask and Django applications all interacting with each other and maybe a database as well, you could just use localhost and everything is gonna work just fine. However, what happens when you start splitting those apps in, into separate nodes, right? How do we actually make sure that the communication layer is, is actually consistent. And I can still pretend that everything works as usual, but this time with, um, with applications distributed across several, several virtual machines. Now, this, this kind of problems is generally solved um, by, by container orchestrators. And uh, it's, it's not just about Kubernetes or HashiCorp Nomad, or you might have heard of Docker Swarm. Those tend to be like the options when you want to go and deploy applications across multiple virtual machines. Now, we're gonna talk about Kubernetes today because it's the most popular, um, but what you learn and what, what you will discover today can be applied um, to other orchestrators as well. So how does, um, how does this Kubernetes work? Um, so Kubernetes is no magic. So you still have the same servers that you had before, but this time what we do is we install what we call the control plane on one of these virtual machines. And then we join, we, we let the rest of the fleet join the control plane and we call these nodes uh, worker nodes. At this point in time, then the cluster behaves like a single unit. And, and this is actually great because when we submit the deployment, that deployment uh, is submitted to the cluster. We don't really care where this deployment will be created. What happens is all of these applications will be deployed, eventually deployed. But where are those applications deployed? Well, Kubernetes is then going to decide which node will receive the application. 
So even if you see, you know, even if when you use Kubernetes, you actually interact with a single unit, then it's the job of the orchestrator to distribute these workloads across your cluster. And going back to a problem, right? What happens when, when our application became, becomes so popular that we have to increase the number of replicas and, 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 and deploy more of these instances across several vision machines? Well, Kubernetes as a concept of the um, horizontal support to scale, which is a way of saying I can increase the number of instances of my applications as the number of memory or as the, as the CPU increases. And then it's got another autoscaler, auto which is the cluster autoscaler, which is basically designed to add nodes to your cluster as you need more space, as you grow with, um, with your demands. And, and in space, the combination of those two, they give you um, a, a quite, quite flexible and elastic way to size your cluster. So you start very small, and as the traffic increases, that you can scale horizontally, so add the number of uh, replicas, so add the number of instances of your apps. And then when you run to, run to space, then you can add more nodes and you can keep doing this. Now, um, there is a gotcha. And, and the gotcha is that you might think that Kubernetes will look at the resource utilization to decide when to add one of these nodes, one of these virtual machines. But it turns out that it does not. So what Kubernetes does is as soon as you create one application, as soon as you deploy an application, or this application is created as a consequence of, of a scaling, um, it's been triggered for, for scaling, then what it will happen is this um, application will look for some space. And if it doesn't find any, then it's going to stay pending. Then Kubernetes actually plugs, in, plugs into these pending events and then eventually will um, will create will create a node. Now, to show you that, uh, I created a cluster beforehand, and um, this is actually my cluster. I've got uh, I deployed three applications, and this purple one is the node, and I've got three instances, so there is a single node. So I'm going to scale to five. What do you expect? to see when I scale to five. Will it deploy all five of them? Probably not. It will deploy four because there is space for four. And then the fifth one will be pending. Then eventually, then the cloud provider will provision a new node. And then hopefully I will see the fifth one being deployed. I also got a timer to track how long this operation takes. So let's do that. Now I'm gonna move this to the side. So we can keep going with the presentation. And we can observe what happens. Okay. So to, to understand how this works, we, we need to take a step back and look how Kubernetes um, <coughs> decide to place these, these, um, these applications in the cluster. And the way it works is when you ask Kubernetes to deploy an application, what happens is Kubernetes will receive the request in, inside what we call the API server and, and will basically just go through a series of steps where um, your request will basically be translated into something that can be deployed. And in technical terms, then when you create a deployment, then the controller manager will create the associated pods and, and let them uh, and store them in the database um, as pending. Then the scheduler will basically look at its pending pods. It will look at the existing infrastructure and then decide where to place those pods. Now, there is a gotcha though. The scheduler doesn't know anything about the application because the application isn't running. So we don't actually know how much memory and CPU it is using, right? How, how, how do you know <laughs> if this is going to use one gigabyte of memory or two or three or four or 16 or more? Well, it, it turns out that. When, when you deploy an application, you can also give hints to, to the scheduler. And these hints, they come in a form of requests. So in Kubernetes, we can define um, requests for memory and CPU. And what happens with, when, you, when you submit the request, you're basically defining what you think is going to be the size of that application. So if you can imagine that there are two axes, so one axis for memory, one for CPU, then we could have an application which is very 
uh, memory intensive or CPU intensive, in this case, CPU intensive, or we could have an application which is memory int intensive. So by writing these requests, we are basically giving a hint of what the application um, is requesting to, to operate normally. Now, these, these requests are then used by the scheduler to decide how to place those um, applications that you have inside the cluster. So uh, for example, this one, it's going to go on the left, and then another one comes in. The schedule will say, "Okay, I'm going to try and balance this left. I'm going to put in the right node, and so on and so forth." So, if you play this game long enough, then Kubernetes will basically just start, start playing Tetris with your infrastructure. So, we'll just basically get all of these applications, measure them, and then see what's the best place to place um, this block, um, which is quite convenient because you can fit quite a lot of applications neatly together. Now, with, with allocations, uh, the challenge is that <laughs> it's always it's, it's not always a straightforward. Um, I mean, in this particular case, I've got an 8 gigabyte. Um, so I, I go to my cloud provider and I get an 8 gigabyte um, instance uh, with two CPUs. And let's say that I, I set my requests for one gigabyte, one gigabyte and a half of memory and a quarter of a CPU. So I basically can fit, you know, if I, if I do the math, then I will be able to fit uh, four blocks uh, within um, uh, within this node. Now, I deploy an application with three and, and it works. And what do you expect if I deploy an application, if I scale this number uh, to four? So what do you expect if I add one more application? Technically, I would expect this to end up in the fourth slot, but it doesn't. It stays pending. Why is that? I mean, this is puzzling, isn't it? Well, the reality is that, and this is going to trigger the autoscaler and then create a new node and deploy a pop. The reality is that um, Kubernetes, but any other sort of container orchestrators, the way it works is there is um, an agent deployed on the node, which consumes some memory and CPU. On top of that, then you've got the operating system. And in the case of Kubernetes, you've got some extra stuff, which is called um, an eviction pressure, which is a way to detect if the node is um, overutilized. In this particular case, um, if you really want to measure, if you really want to be precise on how much space you have um, inside your nodes, then what you should do um, is basically just subtracting the memory and CPU used by, used by the kubelet and operating system and the eviction pressure for the available memory for the node. Um, and that will give you um, and that will give you the total mem total resources available to your applications. So this is an example from AWS, for example. Um, and you will see that if you do the math, an M5 large will give you seven gigabytes of memory, um, which is Quite a lot, ninety percent. But other cloud providers are, aren't <laughs> aren't that good. Um, so this is for saying that when when we actually create create this um, instance type, then we need to pay, pay attention to to how it works. Now, while I'm saying that um, the node has been provisioned, so I'm just waiting for for the final node to appear, for the final final pod, um, two pods to appear. Hopefully that will happen as well. Now, the, the issue that you're saying you're seeing here is it's actually taking quite quite a while. Um, is is that you know scaling takes doesn't take a lot of time, but actually the problem that and the cluster to scale the text that the pod, the pod is pending in within thirty seconds and this is configurable so you could go low you could go down with with that number, um, but the issue right now and and you can see from the six seconds is that provisioning. A cloud VM is, is extremely slow. Um, and there is a, some, some, some stuff after that. But the bulk of the time that we are waiting here is, is actually provisioning this node, right? Until this is fully provisioned, uh, then we can't do much. Now, what, what problem is this and, and how we can fix it? I mean, in this particular case, it's not big deal, right? We're just waiting for it to happen. And eventually, we will see it working, hopefully. But the problem is that. Um, it has actually an implication on how the application scale. So I, I recorded um, a session 
so it's easier for us to discuss. But what I have here is um, I've got Locust, which is a way to send traffic to an application. Below down here, you can see there is um, a cluster with two nodes, and there are already four pods. And then on the right, you can see um, the list of applications deployed in a cluster. And on the bottom, you can see the nodes that have been provisioned. Now, as, as I move this video, you can see that the traffic goes up. As the traffic goes up, the number of replicas, the number of instances of my applications increases as well. And I can see that here, and I can see that in the list of applications as well. But at a certain point in time, then more applications are added, but we can't really cope with, uh, with the traffic because these applications are pending because there are no pods. What happens next is that eventually in this time, this is basically the lead time when the cloud provider is provisioning the virtual machine and giving it back to us. You can see that we are waiting, we are waiting, we are waiting. I don't know if you spot the issue here, but while we are waiting, we still have only eight replicas. So the response we can handle goes flat. So I would expect you know, this to go linear, this line to be linear, right? So the more requests we have, the more we can serve. But unfortunately, all of these apps are, are stuck pending. So, so we've got a flat response. So we can still respond to a fixed number of, of requests. Eventually, we will get these virtual machines back from the cloud provider. And then we will be able to handle more load. This is where we can recover. But, but this is quite annoying, right? We are quite slow because we are very reactive in the way we approach the problem. Now, what, what we, can we do? Let's, let's have a look at this. So this one now, it is actually in four, in five. T took actually a bit of time, but we've got it working. Um, and we've got two nodes and um, and you took over over five minutes. So we've got two nodes and, and five parts. Now, let me scale back. Oh, scale back. So I'm going to click on scale to one. Hopefully I'm going to be lucky. Otherwise, we will just fix it. Not very lucky today. Um, I'm just waiting for the pod. Oh, maybe you can just make it work like this. Um, so I'm just going to apply a command, which is going to be um, useful in, in a second. Okay. It's, it's going to be clear in a second why we do this. So, so what, what option do we have for, um, for solving this problem, right? Because we don't want this response to be flat. Uh, we, want, we, want to be, we want to be able to react quickly to the incoming traffic. So we have two options. One is we don't scale, which <laughs> sounds... Um, <laughs> So that's something funny, but we'll see. We'll see how it what, what it means. So or we actually we're actually proactive about about scaling. So let me mean, let, let me explain what I mean by uh, don't scale. So what I mean. So I, I gave you the example of um, a virtual machine which, which has got eight gigabyte of memory and two CPU, and then we basically sliced that instance into four blocks, and we saw how this this is um, not how things work, right? Because there are some memory and CPU reserved for operating system or agents or, or something else. Now, what, what, if we, what if we actually size it properly now? Um, the outcome is that if we, if we know that this application is going to scale to four instances, for example, when we've got peak load, then there won't be any need to create a second node, right? Because we size it properly, then we are sure that this, this actually is going to be uh, what we see in, in production. So we, we can basically save on this auto, cluster autoscaler. We can save on, on some resources on this side. Um, 
to, to understand how this works, we actually built a, a smaller tool which you can visit online, which you know, given given a uh, given an instance, it will basically suggest the um, the right property for your pods, um, so you can optimize the number of uh, the number of um, applications that you can deploy inside. That will basically help you with the auto scaling um, and make sure that you don't trigger it prematurely. The the other option that you have um, is actually proactive scaling. We with proactive scaling, what we do is, uh, and you can see that we are starting. To match the the real cluster, what you do is you basically create an application big enough to fit the entire node, and and that application does nothing, just like sits there doing nothing. And but when it sits there and do, and, and does nothing, um, the the important thing is that we give um, this application a very very low priority. And and Kubernetes what it does is when it runs out of resources then is going to evict the applications with lower priority to make space for applications with, with a higher priority. So in this particular case, what we do is this application is doing nothing with a very, very low priority. As soon as it is, we have a spike of traffic, then the, the, um, the application autoscaler will basically create more, um, more, more instances. And, and this pod, this, this placeholder, what, what it will do will basically be evicted to make space for the instances um, that, have been, that have been scaled. Now, since this placeholder has been evicted and, and cannot be deployed anywhere in the cluster, it will basically go pending and that will trigger the cluster autoscaler. But in reality, we're quite fine with that because we don't need it. I mean, we, we deployed a number of applications that we wanted, um, yeah. The placeholder can go on and, and trigger the autoscaler. We don't really mind. And, and this is exactly, and this is exactly what you know the benefit, the benefit of this. So let me show you, let me show you in practice what, how it works. So I'm just going to refresh here. And I'm going to scale to five. So what do you expect now? Is it going to still take five minutes? Not really. It's going to be almost immediate, hopefully. Done. It took about 12, 12 seconds. And we have um, we have all the five applications deployed. Now, what, what is happening is so if I go and switch back to the cluster and I list these applications, then I can see that um, I can see that there is a pending. Um, there is a pen, this placeholder is pending, which in turn will trigger the cluster autoscaler. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm fine with it because I wanted to have five instances. So it's job done. Now, you might think this is, um, <laughs> this is, this is cheating because, you know, in the first instance, we had the single node. And in the second example, we had two nodes already. Um, and I agree with you. Having a placeholder means that you always have a node which is there doing nothing. So you're still paying for it um, and, and it sits there underutilized. Not, you're basically not utilizing it, uh, which is not great. But at the end of the day, it's a trade-off that you make and it's something that you, know, you, you need to, to keep in mind if you want, if you want a smooth scaling. Let me show you what so I showed you how the traffic is impacted by very slow scaling. So let me show you the opposite. So let me show you what happens when, so the exact, exactly the same scenario, but this time we have a placeholder um, on this, we have a placeholder deployed. So let me show you how the difference between um, how quickly this, um, this configuration can scale. So just to, to recap, I've got, I'm gonna generate some traffic here. I'm gonna monitor the uh, number of um, responses that I get. I've got a list of applications deployed in the cluster and a list of nodes towards the bottom. So as I drive more traffic, I can see that the placeholder has been evicted to make space for more pods. In this particular case, the autoscaler and the one node has already been provisioned in the background, 
So while you see, I haven't fully utilized the current node, another one has been provisioned in the background, right? And as I move on, then the node is already ready and empty. And then you can see the placeholder has been evicted already, again evicted. And then you can see that right now, the response is almost linear, right? So we are able to cope with an ever-growing number of requests um, because we have this placeholder part, which is basically triggering, uh, provisioning these this, um, nodes in, in advance. And you can see <laughs> live here. So if I scale up to nine, it will be instantaneous, but then the placeholder will be evicted. Okay. Um, so what's the placeholder looking like? Well, we use the same strategy as before, and we just basically look at the entire size of the instance, and then we just subtract whatever is reserved for Kubernetes, the operating system, and the eviction threshold. That, that's what we do. The other trick that we use in Kubernetes is to assign a priority class, and that priority class is basically saying that whenever, whenever you're running out of space, this particular, this particular part um, this particular instance, this particular application should be evicted to make space for others. And, and that's it, basically. That's, uh, that's the trick. So um, just a quick recap on what we discussed today and um, how this trick works. So you can, you can use, uh, you can scale your application. And, and this doesn't apply just to applications like web applications. But for example, if you've got salary workers, and, and you need to dynamically increase and decrease the number of nodes to, to make space to, for more salary workers, that, that this, this is a viable option as well. Um, but elastic scaling, you know, if, if you rely on the cloud provider provisioning VM is quite slow. And, and the nature of it is because the cloud provider takes time to provision these VMs. Um, however, scaling is quite convenient because if we don't use a virtual machine, then that virtual machine, uh, will be um, we we won't pay for it. Now we have a look. We had a look at how Kubernetes handle handles um, requests. How requests are used by the scheduler to determine um, where this this application should be placed in the cluster. Um, so they basically, you could think about the scheduler as, as a as a very skilled Tetris player, um, which is gonna which is gonna place these blocks in in the cluster. And to solve these issues with very quick scaling, then we had a look at how we can perfect um, the size of the node and, and the size of the application based on the node that we have. So a combination of how much space I've got available, how much I can use, and what, what would be the best configuration. And then as, as the last part, we had a look at how we can, we can basically have a trade-off between um, we can have a yeah we can have a trade-off on you know we can spend a little bit more money and keep one of these instances running um, empty, um, but in the, on, on on the flip side we gain uh, quite a lot of speed when when um, we, there are traffic spikes in, um, in in your traffic. Yeah, that's. Um, that's all I wanted to show you today. So I think, um, I hope you enjoyed. You can see the nine pods here and the placeholder as well. Um, and um, thank you very much for listening to, to the talk.